it's Monday the 17th of October. I'm Michael Walker. I'm James Butler. And you're watching The Fix. Uh, we've got a good lineup for you today. We're going to be interviewing Lara McNeil about Young Labour. We're also going to talk about the Austrian elections. First off, me and James have both been reading economic reports this weekend. And we've, we've come to the same conclusion, haven't we, James? <laughs> a spectre is haunting Europe. What spectre is it? It's the spectre of communism. Of fully automated luxury communism, no less. And we haven't just been reading the latest blog post from our very own Dr. Bastano. This is from the big dogs of the economic establishment. UCL University, that's my one. And you've been reading economic leftism from an even more surprising source, which is the IMF. Yeah, the International Monetary Fund. Um, I mean, it's worth saying that it's leftism of the most pallid kind. Um, the IMF has been catching on to uh, non-austerity-based thought for some time. Um, the report that's come out is it's the same report it issues every half a year. It's half yearly fiscal monitor. It's basically dedicated to systematically destroying the idea that taxing the rich uh, is, is pointless or even destructive to an economy. It's an idea that's been circulating for many years now. Um, and it goes into detail about the policies that can be funded uh, if you were to, to up the tax rates on, on, on the rich. Uh, they say that, uh, in, you know, in uh, the front of the report, that when inequality gets bad, it can erode social cohesion, it can lead to political polarisation, and ultimately lower economic growth. Um, so the IMF got woke. <laughs> well, I don't think you can ever describe the IMF as woke. Um, and you note the third part of the argument there, right, which is that it's actually uh, economic growth that's a threat. So that's what they've got in mind. But basically they argue that we need a steeper tax curve for higher earners, so higher marginal rates, on the top earners, and those have been declining in trend for years and years and years. Um, we should look into different kinds of wealth tax, um, which we might consider beyond income tax. And that's actually quite important in the UK because we have an enormous amount of land hoarded by the aristocracy, uh, and the aristocrats really use a great number of uh, uh, tax loopholes, particularly around inheritance tax. Uh, we should look also at taxing capital income, uh, which is really unequally distributed, so these are like profit, interest, mm -hmm. capital gains, dividends, stuff like that, which come from having capital in the first place to invest. It's at the moment, that's very low, right? It's very, capital very, very low. Capital super low. Very low. So we should up that. The one bit of income that's not in any way earned whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It just sits there and gives yeah. you more money, right? Um, so it also goes into praising uh, the stuff that's been on the left now for a while. <laughs> but not without... Uh, criticism, not without pause, it, it, it praises it for developing economies. It says uh, in economies where there's mm -hmm. a developed and uh, variegated welfare state, uh, maybe it's not going to work so well. It's sceptical about how useful it can be there. And obviously it points out, as we know, that its redistributive impact depends on how it's financed. Mm -hmm. So it would tie into that question of how you tax people. And the other thing it says is, look, you've really got to spend on health and on education it points out that the disparities in health outcomes cut across uh, every economy. Uh, you look at people, you know, it, it's particularly true of men, men who have uh, tertiary education uh, and men who leave education at secondary school have wildly differing um, uh, life expectancies and that goes across even nations where you might not think that's the case. So there's lots of stuff like that that, that, that actually health spending and education spending can really bite into. And obviously this is, um, you know, positive for the Labour Party, which proposes, uh, you know, a uh, new 45% and 50% tax bans. I've got three questions for you, James. Mm -hmm. So this is the IMF. This is the institution that has spent decades forcing governments to take on neoliberal policies, the Washington consensus, low taxes on the rich because it will destroy growth, uh, cut government spending because it will create inflation. What's caused this turnaround? Have they apologised? And the third question, are the IMF now to the left of Ed Miliband's 2015 manifesto? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'm not going to speculate. I mean, it's a very difficult comparison to make on that one. We'll get him but, on and ask but, him. Yeah, well, why not? He, he wants to, to be uh, a Corbynite now as well. It's very you know, red washing going on here. Um, look, I mean, there's a long way to go. And there's been a, like, a, you know, the Washington consensus has been fragmenting certainly since 2013, maybe even a little earlier. Um, one of the things that, that uh, one of the guys from the IMF points out is that average top rates of tax across the OECD have declined since 1980 from 62% to 31%. That's an appalling mm -hmm. fall. Um, and it's, it's one that, that we have a long way to go before we redress. Um, 
But in 2013, Olivier, Olivier Blanchard, who's the, who was the chief economist of the IMF at the time, said, we've been wrong about Keynesianism. Actually, what we thought uh, Keynesianism did in terms of this technical argument about something called the multiplier, basically the mm -hmm. effect that stimulus has on an economy, uh, we've been wrong about that. Uh, and then in 2016, this percolates through the IMF, um, and in 2016, they come out actually very strongly and say, look, austerity, uh, as, as it has been applied, just doesn't work. It doesn't do the things that it claims it's done. They, they defend liberalisation in some way. It's not that they've got really woke. There's not, they're not ra waving the red mm -hmm. flag. It's still the IMF. Um, but, it, you know, they say in dealing with the GFC uh, global financial crisis, austerity has been a disaster. Mm -hmm. It's been a disaster in those countries in which it's been implemented, including the UK. So uh, that's what they have to say. It's been going. It's, you know, the consensus has been going for a long time now. Uh, and it finally looks like it's really started to crack. This is a, an important strategic question for the Labour Party, of course, mm -hmm. uh, and beyond that for the left, which is that uh, actually our opponents are going to feel actually very free to move beyond austerity. And so we have to think about how the right is going to try to buy off. Yeah. It also means we can be bold. We can be bold. So it's fair to say the IMF are not quite woke, but they're just catching up what was already the consensus on, among most economists who weren't sort of trapped in that. <laughs> yeah, bubble of enough. financiers. Um, pushing the economic debate forward this week, or released last week, is a report from UCL which is proposing universal basic services. Uh, this is pitched slightly in opposition to universal basic income or as an alternative to universal basic income. And the idea is that to improve our society so that everyone can participate fully in the economy, what we should be proposing is to expand the principles that undergird the NHS and housing to all the areas or most of the areas that are essential to participate in life, to, to lead a good life. So that includes housing, communication, the internet, food, and shut. oh, I've already said housing. <laughs> housing, the internet. Food and shelter go together. Food. Somewhere. Transport. <laughs> That's the fourth one. Um, we're actually going to get them all up now. Let's get all those details up now. So we'll get what they proposed for housing first. So for housing, they are proposing doubling the existing social housing stock by funding the building of 1.5 million new social houses. The new units would be offered on a needs basis at zero rent with utilities provided at zero charge. This will cost 6 billion a year, rising to 13 billion within seven years. That's a very ambitious proposal. The call for council homes is getting, oh, this, the call for council homes is getting more and more popular, more and more hegemonic, but no one's quite talked about making them free yet. I mean, free rent, that would not just improve the quality of people's lives, but it would turbocharge the economy. Imagine you're not spending 600 pound a week on, on rent. What are you gonna do with that money? Some of it you're gonna save, a lot of it you're gonna spend in the local economy. That's gonna be massive. The ne yeah. yeah, we're into yeah, it, yeah, right? Yeah. The, ne the next one is food, we're gonna go to food. Food, another obvious essential in life. Where they're gonna provide one third of meals for the 2.2 million households experiencing food insecurity, and this is gonna cost four billion pound per year. I'm not sure if I, I did say how much it's gonna cost last time. We're gonna get onto cost in a second. Um, this is something we, again, we don't really talk about free food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes a lot of sense in a period where we've got millions of families relying on food banks. Why doesn't the state just provide that? And a massive problem with child nutrition as well, right? There's mm -hmm. a real, real concern. Um, about children who go home from school and the school holidays have massive, massive food poverty and it has a real developmental effect. And so, the, you know, this is one of the great social evils that we should be thinking of just mm -hmm. as we did uh, after the war. Next one, transport. So we're going to extend freedom passes for bus services to all. And if bus use increases by 260%, this will cost £5 billion a year bargain. IMO. <laughs> uh, so this is the freedom passes that currently you get if you're over 60. That means you can get on any bus for free. My parents both have it. They absolutely love it. Uh, man, I, I saw my dad on the night bus the other day. He, he was on the bus for free. I was paying however much it costs on an Oyster, £1.50. How unjust is that? <laughs> Not any longer under this proposal. And finally, pro potentially most ambitious is information. So they're going to provide Everyone with a basic phone, TV license and internet, which is going to cost £20 billion a year. That's quite a lot. Uh, I love this proposal. I think it's exactly the kind of ambitious, radical social democracy we should be talking about. It's taking the essentials of life out of commodity circulation. Uh, this would presumably be democratically controlled. And it really gives us freedom to, to live a decent life experiment. I was looking on 
Twitter about people commenting on American healthcare. And one point they were making is imagine if we have free healthcare, imagine how much more freedom you have to challenge your boss when your health insurance isn't connected to your work. Imagine if we have housing and food provided. Imagine how much we can demand in the workplace. Imagine how ambitious we can be. Yeah, I mean, in that sense, it's a kind of, uh, you know, classic uh, bridging demand, right? That it allows, that it actually has positive uh, and, you know, outcomes that go beyond it. I mean, I think, you know, like you, I think it's a, a really uh, ambitious and, and important report. I mean, I think it does something very important, which is think about the way in which societies cohere. And uh, one of the, my favourite lines comes from a sociologist called uh, Titmus, uh, R.H. Titmus. Um, who, who makes the point, and it's a very obvious point in some ways, that actually, unless you have a system in which uh, the rich, or even the well-off, uh, are committed to uh, something like society, so that they, so they're not incentivized to avoid tax or to, because uh, it will always be cheaper for them to find a way to privately provide mm -hmm. uh, for themselves rather than paying to society. So that sense is really, really important, and it can really you know, be done by these, these kind of universal things. So the two things that I think are really striking is the transport thing, because mm -hmm. like you, my parents both have freedom passes and they love it. Love it. Um, and the uh, digital thing, which I think is also really, really ambitious. Um, one of the things the report says, it's quite um, relaxed about provision. It says, oh, it could come from the private sector, it can come, uh, you know, from, from, from sort of public expenditure, from, from, from the public sector, or it can come from voluntary organisations, but these need to be democratically mm -hmm. controlled. I think provision is an important question. Actually, that can have a real impact on cost. It can have a real impact on actually what kind of services I mean, if you, are, uh, these are and what kind of houses these are. Right? If you're building 1.5 million new houses for zero rent, I mean, that's got to be done by the state. I can't really see how anyone else <laughs> yeah, is going to provide agree, that, unless we have a terrible sort of rebirth of PFI. But yeah, I don't no, think yeah, anyone's particularly true. in the mood to do that. No. What about, so the left has been talking over the last seven years, mainly about defending current services from austerity and universal basic income. Do you prefer this to UBI? Yeah, I absolutely do. I think it does something really important, which is uncouples this stuff from the monetary relation. And so basically, it, you know, you're not being given money which can go then into the hand of rentiers. So it can mm -hmm. go into the hands of your landlord, or it can go into the hands of a, mono a monopolist. And these are people who will raise the prices in accord with yep. universal basic income. So I, you know, I'm, I've always been very skeptical about, in our current economy, in our current political economic setup, introducing uh, a, basically a, a chunk of cash that can then go yeah. into the hands of people who run the world. Um, this is much, much better, and actually provides uh, the sense that, that it, it's something you can move beyond as well. The, the question for me, though, is about infrastructure. So it's really, really important um, for us to, to get a sense that you don't just have free buses, but you have buses that run more than once a day. Mm -hmm. You don't just have, you know, the ability to access transport, but you have transport more equally distributed. A massive spend on transport in London, and that is understandable. But the spend across the rest of the UK mm -hmm. is really, really poor. Um, you well, know, I mean, our, our examples for what happens when you make something universal and free are quite good. I yeah. mean, NHS provision is pretty good. It's not like because it's free, it got, it got worse. Mm, mm, uh, I prefer it to UBI. I think my critique of UBI is, can be expressed in the same way as the right-wing one, which is that money is going to get wasted. But for me, it's not going to get wasted because of booze and gambling. It's going to get wasted because that goes straight into the pocket of an ordinary person. And then at the beginning of the month, it goes straight into the pocket of a landlord. And that's just the state subsidizing people who are milking us all. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the point, let's move to yeah. UBI, but first of all, let's expropriate the rentiers, build the social <laughs> housing, so we can actually spend the UBI on on booze and not gambling, but booze and books and cinema and rents already sorted. <laughs> cinema, I feel like I'm sort of learning French or something. <laughs> um, you need a nice black sweater. Yeah, how are they going to pay for it? We'll do this very quickly, but in total, everything they suggest is going to come to forty-two billion pound per year. Sounds like a lot. It's only two point three percent of GDP, which for what you're getting, that seems like bang for your buck. We've already discussed about how this itself would promote growth, more money in people's pockets, means more money circulating, more jobs, more taxes. Uh, they're going to fund it, well, they've suggested funding it by lowering the personal tax allowance, which means you pay tax from a lower threshold than you currently do. They're saying about 4.5k. That covers the whole of it. You might argue that we should pay for it by just taxing the rich. I think their argument is this makes it politically easier 
easier to collect if you've got a broader tax base. And also by their sums, this still works out as incredibly progressive. So it's going to increase the incomes, the yeah, weekly incomes of people at the bottom decile by £80 a week, yeah. is what, they're, what yeah. they're saying. I mean, I don't think you should give up on the idea of taking quite a substantial chunk of this from those who yeah. have profited for years over the fact that there isn't yeah. sufficient social housing provision. No, I mean, yeah, we'll, we can figure out where to tax it from. But in the, at the same time, I mean, how much time do we want to think about taxing landlords and how much time do we want to think about taking away the institutional power sure. they have? Absolutely. That's sort of really the priority, isn't it? Is it fully automated luxury communism? No, but uh, it might be a step on the way there. It's a start, all right. <laughs> uh, we're going to move on to the Austrian elections in the land. I'm not sure what we were watching there. <laughs> in the land of the <laughs> Donald Duck. In the land Isn't of... That Scrooge McDuck? Yeah, yeah. Into no. Oh, Scrooge. Oh, Scrooge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, Expropriate I, I know that my bastard. popular culture, right. despite my reputation. So in the world of economic reports, the left is doing quite well, the left is hegemonic. In the world of actually existing elections in Europe, there is another spectre haunting us. There is indeed, James. there is indeed. And unfortunately, it's the spectre of the right and the far right. Uh, and what I'm obviously talking about here is uh, the election in Austria over the weekend, uh, which uh, brought out this uh, Patrick Bateman looking <laughs> guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, Jesus Christ! <laughs> the images came a little bit before the punchline. <laughs> yeah, well, but, but so this is uh, uh, Sebastian Kurz, who is uh, who looks like Patrick looks, Bateman. That's really why you were just is, showing I mean, that video. You know, he really <laughs> looks like Patrick Bateman. Um, he, he is uh, the the leader of the uh, Austrian People's Party, and uh, he will very shortly be uh, the Austrian Chancellor. Uh, the uh, the People's Party is the the um, traditional conservative, mm -hmm. Christian democratic party, very fusty, very kind of old school conservative. He's brightened them up a bit, he's changed their logo to turquoise, brought in some non-political mm. people, which may sound familiar from Monsieur Macron, um, and also sort of, uh, you know, uh, very personally branded it, which is also common uh, right-wing tactic, although not limited. With his people. young, dashing good looks, right? Everyone's yeah. talking about his 31. Oh, uh, God, the, you know, yes, uh, young millennial uh, now in power, hates mm. migrants. Here's one secret trick to... Millennial xenophobes, fabulous. Um, yeah, no, so, I mean, part of this is the failure of right-wing social democracy, right? Um, and, and the Social Democrats have been in a, a, a grand coalition in Austria, and they have been, uh, you know, basically given their imprint to technocratic right-wing rule, and this tainted them in an electoral basis. Um, you know, it's his political background, Herb, that worries me. It, you know, I am very, very worried about Sebastian Kurz. While he was a minister, he promoted very, very strong xenophobic policies. He said to send all refugees back, harden all European borders even further than they mm -hmm. already are. Uh, he has supported a full ban on the burqa, uh, calling it not a religious symbol, but a symbol for a counter society. And he's made much of his like rather inflated, actually, role in closing the uh, migrant route on, mm -hmm. in the West Balkans, so that the entry point, uh, quite dangerous entry point, in fact, taken into Europe. God, he really is a Patrick Bateman looking mm. motherfucker, isn't he? And the, the, um, the context but, is basically there was a populist right wing party that was doing, that was polling yeah, first, so the Freedom the, Party. The Freedom Party, and he's taken on quite a lot of their traits. It's quite, again, quite a common story is about the, the institutional party pulling to the right. Uh, and in a country, you know, he's now talking about banning headscarves for judges and police officers. Now, no one in Austria can find a police officer uh, or a judge who has worn a headscarf. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so this guy uh, is going to have an impact. There's been a very dirty campaign in which the Social Democrats have really covered themselves in muck. They probably funded this uh, site, this website, smearing him mm. in an anti-Semitic way. Um, at the same time, he's been, you know, really profiting on just out-and-out -out racism. Um, so, yeah, this is bad. It's going to, you know, it's likely that on a European level, we'll see him join um, Orban in Hungary, the uh, Law and Justice Party in Poland. These are kind of quite extreme xenophobic right-wing parties, demand much, much harsher treatment of migrants uh, than already is the case in Europe. Uh, and, you know, this party itself has profited uh, on a kind of very, very right-wing Euroscepticism, mm -hmm. so it won't be afraid to attack Brussels as it needs to. It's likely it will join the, the what's sometimes called the Visegrad Group, uh, this sort of coalition of kind of Central European countries, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, um, who have been a very, very strong, regressive voice mm. within the EU. Do you have an explanation for that bunching of, of 
authoritarian populisms. Yeah, well, look, I mean, I think... I, I think In Central Europe. Yeah, right? I mean, I think the long-term story here is one of massive injustice within the EU, uh, in which these are all countries that were brought very, very quickly into the EU. Quite rightly, many of them look suspiciously at Germany as profiting off uh, you know, the, you know the way in which they accession the EU. So Germany's kind of use of guest workers mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, they were also promised quite a, a large amount of kind of structural funding from the EU. Um, not all of which has arrived since. Mm. You know, some of it has, but but not all of it has. So there's a sense that they're very much a kind of second tier within the EU, which they regard as a sort of Franco-German mm -hmm. uh, uh, members club. Um, it's important to to note, I guess, that this this party, the far right party, the Freedom Party. Um, is the party of Jörg Haider, who, who, who some uh, viewers may remember. In 2000, he was brought into governing coalition, um, and uh, there were diplomatic sanctions against Austria across Europe. That isn't going to happen now, because this is the new face of Europe. Mm, the new normal. Mm. Uh, of course, what we're hoping is that the Social Democratic Party drop their anti-Semitic campaigns and take on something that looks a bit like Corbynism. Yes. Uh, but I don't think we know enough about Austrian politics to say whether or not that's going to happen. <laughs> it's not likely. Uh, we're Absolutely. now going to have a break. When I come back, I'm going to be interviewing Lara McNeil about yesterday's or the weekend's Young Labour Conference. See you in two minutes. <laughs> Over the last 10 years, things have really changed. Us. It's about us. But for all of the darkness, every cause has an effect. For all the talk of change, the present moment is really one of crisis. A crisis of democratic representation. Of identity. A climate crisis. Of a failing economic model which isn't working for most people. We can't have a media that's beholden to advertisers or the political ambitions of oligarchs. Which is why, in 2013, we founded Navarra Media. Unlike corporate media, we are funded by our subscribers. There's no tax avoiders, there's no oil money and there's no lords. What we're creating is media for you, which quite simply, you make possible. We're looking to raise £40,000. That will allow us to not only keep on paying our contributors, but give them a little bit more, as well as keep our studio and take our fantastic Navarra events nationwide. To help us get there, go to support.navarramedia.com and give a one-off donation, or even better, sign up for a subscription. We've already achieved so much, but the truth is, we've barely started. Welcome back. We've been planning to update that advert for a while. You've been watching it for a few months. It's very important for us, one, because we need your, your kind donations to continue this operation, and two, because it gives us two minutes to shuffle the chairs and, and move the set, so that's what was going on then. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Lara McNeil. Welcome to the show. Hello. Lara, you. you are Vice Chair of Labour Students yes. and on the Young, London Young Labour Committee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're here because L Young Labour, the UK-wide one, had their conference this weekend, mm -hmm. and... It's made the news because it had some, yes, some yeah. rather bold policies get passed. Indeed, um, yeah. So we had capital controls. Yeah. We had leaving NATO. Yeah. We had nationalising the yeah. banks. Yeah. This is a bit of a pivot for young Labour, isn't it? Yeah, it's, I think it's exciting. I think um, a lot of it was in the young people always seem to be maybe more left wing in the Labour Party mm -hmm. or in, in general. Um, and I think after Corbyn being in power for in the Labour Party for like the last two years, maybe we're starting to see some of that actually translate into policy, into motions. Um, and I'm really impressed that young Labour are leading the way on some like serious issues. So it's like when we actually get into power, we've mm -hmm. got some policy, which we've recommended to the National Policy Forum. That's the process. Um, oh, so that's how this works. This goes yeah. to the National Policy Forum proposed by young Labour. Yeah, exactly. So I think a lot of people maybe think that, so we have conferences where we can pass policy. Mm -hmm. This is specifically MPF recommendations uh, from Young Labour, um, essentially trying to represent what Young Labour wants mm -hmm. so that the Labour Party listen to us in the manifesto. So I think it's exciting that we're leading the way on some of these, uh, you know, in more radical things, mm -hmm. um, but they're going to be very important when we actually get into power. Let's go through those three big ones then. So okay. leaving NATO, what's the, what's the argument? So um, 
I honestly didn't know too much about it when I walked <laughs> in that conference room. Not, not going to lie. Um, that's international affairs has never been uh, my strong point in politics. However, I there were some uh, really strong arguments uh, from... I think everyone who spoke in that debate, we had about four rounds of speeches, were all like first time delegates, which was really exciting because um, they were really uh, sort of intellectual speeches um, about essentially how uh, NATO has been um, an excuse or been associated with American mm -hmm. imperialism. And a lot of, and there were arguments against, and I think I felt that. They did. They did kind of reminisce a little bit back to the another Europe is possible kind of scope on the campaign about being inside NATO, being okay. able to remain and reform. Or... Exactly. Um, so, I think the points made for were very sort of strong and gave very examples. There's actually kind of an emotional debate talking about some of the things that you know the West have done, mm -hmm. um, and you know how we need to think seriously about that um, and not play into sort of rhetoric around how sort of excusing America for its actions um so yeah it was it was a good debate um on both sides but I think I'm happy with the result. We'll move, we'll move to capital controls and nationalizing the banks mm -hmm. uh, roll them into one capital controls I saw I, I read the motions it was mentioning a lot about Syriza right so this is mm -hmm. people really learning from left-wing mm. attempts at government mm. around Europe and learning from them what was what were the arguments for capital controls and for nationalizing the banks Again, I think it was like uh, learning from past. I think a lot of what the Tories throw at us is, oh, look at these socialist countries or these sort of socialist experiments that haven't worked. Mm -hmm. I think we can't afford to be a social experiment that doesn't work. Um, it's, it's about looking through and how we're actually going to implement our manifesto when we get into power. Um, Nationalising the banks had some very strong arguments behind it, you know, after the uh, financial crash. And I think... Um, yeah, it's just strong left-wing economic mm -hmm. policy, which is ultimately what we're going to have to do when we get into government and it inevitably sort of international capital doesn't like it. So the more controversial than what was passed was perhaps what wasn't passed. So there were two controversies, misunderstood or otherwise, uh, that can be for you to explain. One, that Young Labour voted against a motion which was for a two-state solution in Israel and Palestine, and the other which was that they voted against defending freedom of movement. Can we mm -hmm. start with the two-state solution? What, what went on there? Yes, yeah, so I think that's probably the most controversial one because I think it probably got uh, misconstrued a little bit, uh, especially in the media. Um, we don't have any policy on Israel-Palestine as Young Labour. Uh, the Labour Party's policy is a two-state solution um, and that is essentially by definition what Young Labour sort of go with um, and I think a two-state solution, a better motion, would have probably passed. Mm -hmm. um, um, what was wrong with the motion? So... Essentially, um, the TUC in general, so obviously at this conference there were a lot of trade union delegates. Um, I don't think they felt like they could vote for it because um, groups it was mentioning in the motion aren't supportive of BDS policy. Um, some unions don't take as big a stance on that, but the TUC essentially mm -hmm. have a version of, you know, they want to uh, disinvest from companies and boycott companies that um, profit out of this, um, illegal settlements. Um, in Israel and I think they didn't feel like they thought it was sort of saying this is what we should do when uh, Palestinian trade unions, Palestinian mm -hmm. people are calling for this so it was sort of ignoring those wishes um, and instead of mentioning groups that trade unions are already working with on this um, it mentioned some more fringe groups which so they didn't feel like the motion was mm -hmm. that um, it didn't address it properly and because it was it was a little bit we already have a two-state solution policy in the Labour Party, having a motion that was sort of similar but a little bit more confused, that it would it would confuse the policy. Um, so yeah, as I say, we don't actually have a policy on it as Young Labour. So I think it was unfair to say that like, Young Labour disagreed with two-state solution because I honestly don't think that would be true. Yeah. Like I certainly wouldn't vote against that. Yeah, look, looking at that motion, it did seem like a slightly bizarre motion that it, referenced yeah. specific groups, which is a bit uncommon for, for that kind of thing. Yeah. The motion which I read, which did seem more like it was a position which was genuinely opposed by Young Labour, was defending freedom of movement. Mm -hmm. That was rejected outright. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain what so, went on there? Yeah, so um, the free movement motion, uh, it didn't really mention... I, I know you had this discussion on the fix or, um, a few episodes back, and I think that was really good because you actually talked about how you would deal with the current system, like not to look at it like everything's fine because... Honestly, trade unions don't think that, workers don't think that everything is fine right now. Um, I think 
we needed to talk more about, the motion didn't mention anything about um, closed shops, anything about how we're going to um, deal with sort of under money of collective bargaining that happens, um, how we're actually going to address the problem. So basically we're saying capitalism is a problem, not immigrants. But it didn't have any steps on how to uh, actually solve the problem. And um, we passed some really good policy as well at this conference about mm -hmm. protecting migrant rights um, and things like that. And people speaking against the motion were not saying they don't want high immigration, they want high levels of immigration. Um, they just don't want to discriminate against people who aren't from the EU. And un um, unions in general were speaking about how it's used by um, capitalists, essentially, to undermine collective bargaining, to cover up sort of the skill shortage in this country by employing lots of nurses and things from the EU. We're not... Um, we're covering up some of the problems that we have in, in educating uh, British workers. Um, so there were strong arguments for and against, and I think it's really difficult not to get caught up in... You want to be careful. You do not want to, like, migrant bash or anything like mm. that um, because you want high levels of immigration. I think it was really difficult. We had a good debate on trying to separate those. Um, the, the, the criticism would be that it buys into some common misconceptions about immigration that migration from the EU significantly reduces wages, which it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't seem to be a huge barrier to union organisation. That would be much more to do with the Trade Union Act or other laws which limit the ability to, to function as a trade mm -hmm. union. Uh, so the question would be, why, do, why not just focus on those and take a bold stand about freedom of movement? In terms of whether or not there was enough in the policy, so this was from Northwest Unite members, in their, their Twitter. So it says, Northwest Unite members leading the way against extending freedom of movement motion. There's no freedom with free movement. Does that statement sum up how you feel about it? Um, I'm not Unite, so I can't yeah. say, say, obviously, um, what they're thinking specifically on that, mm -hmm. in that tweet. I think possibly what they're trying to get at is we are in a capitalist system and a lot of migrants come here to work here for a better life, um, but they're not free and they are exploited by their employers still. Um, and often, you know, it's used as a threat against uh, workers already in this country and to say, um, you know, you can employ these workers on less money and things like that. Um, so I think it's probably talking about, like, the system in general mm -hmm. is not working. And it, going back to the motion, it, it was saying defend and extend free movement. So it was, it was defending the current system, which is used by capitalists. I'm not sure I'd say that would completely sum up my view on it, but um, I know a lot of strong feelings by unions are organising migrant workers. So it's not, it's not about, like, you know, British ver um, workers versus migrant workers. The, the people coming up to speak on it were saying how this affects migrant workers as well and their rights. And... People spent, you know, so much time organising these workers mm. as well. Um, and yes, we did pass, you know, pro-migrant policy along with that. And so, yeah, that would be my view on it. Um, so, final question, we'll move away from the policies. Uh, one of the most important constitutional roles Young Labour has within the Labour Party is its position on the NEC. I think that comes up for election next year. Yeah. I know there's been some controversies about how democracy functions within Young mm. Labour, whether there's some fiddling from above. I know there was a conference where Labour students were given... That was this conference. That was this conference where <laughs> Labour students so were given a third of delegates. So it was actually surprising how the results turned out because mm. um, a third of those uh, delegates So you were expecting were that to be watered down? Yeah. OK. Yeah. But in, in your overall assessment of how Young Labour is organised, how it's going as an institution, does it have a bright future or are there still challenges to making this an organisation where members really have a voice? So, yeah, it's, it's got, like... 95,000 members now. Um, it's it's a huge organisation. It's tripled in membership. Um, and we're having this democracy view in the Labour Party and we hope that will cover Young mm. Labour. And But yeah, we have one rep on the NEC. Uh, we have uh, one member of staff, the National Youth Officer, but they're not elected. So I have any elected members of staff, which often leads to conflict between the political aims of the elected committee, um, staff, um, and things like that. And I think... The conference, this conference, was decided, the location and the timing and the delegate makeup was all decided by the NEC, which has uh, two young members on it. Mm -hmm. One of which is the youth rep, one of which is the CLP rep, Rhea. Um, and so everything is dictated over the current committee who are elected by the young members. And I think the democracy view is going to be good if it covers us. But it's a shame that had to come from above, that mm -hmm. had to come from Jeremy, that had to come from, you know, democratisation of the party rather than what we want as, like, young members and have been calling for a long, long, long time. Um, and it's a shame that it 
the Labour Party, but in general, like you are sort of patronised mm. as a movement. I mean, are they are they worried that we're going to be you know too radical? Are they worried? You know, what are they worried about? And it's like you should trust young you might workers. Might stoke that fear a little like, bit this weekend. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure, <laughs> but I think there's a lot of frustration, and they should just they should trust the youth movement mm. to be autonomous. Like they only just got their own bank account for Young Labour. Like it's moving slowly, but I hope it will be in the right direction. Um, it's unfortunate it has to come from sort of a democracy view from above, though, above. isn't it, really? All right, we're going to have to end it there. Laura McNeil, thank you so much for joining us. No I'm sure we'll have you back on to talk about the future of Young Labour yeah. or the whole Labour Party. Uh, <laughs> this was The Fix. Uh, see you in a week. <laughs>